My name is uh, Rich Troughton. I work for the Howard Hughes Medical Institute uh, at their Genelia Research Campus. And this is a session on virtualization and OS 10 testing. So before we get started, uh, there's two things I'd like to mention. The first is that all the slides, speakers, notes, and the demos are available for download. And I'll be providing a link at the end of the talk. I, I tend to be one of those folks who can't keep up with the speaker and take notes at the same time. So for those folks in that same situation, there's no need to take notes. Everything, absolutely everything, is going to be available for download. The second is to please hold all questions until the end. If you've got questions, make a note of them, and then ask me afterwards during the Q&A session. Um, hopefully, I'll be able to answer most of your questions during the talk itself. So when new software appears, we all need test boxes that match our standard configuration in order to verify that that new software doesn't adversely affect anything. Now, this usually means we need an available test box or we have to go find one. Now, the advent of good virtualization solutions means that it's easier than ever before to perform this testing without needing to collect and use physical test boxes. VMware Fusion and VMware ESXi have been the tools I've been using for this, so let's talk about how you can use these tools to quickly you know, build test VMs that match your needs. So in VMware Fusion 5, VMware added Netboot support for virtual machines running Mac OS X. Now this proved to be an enormous boon to Mac admins who use Netboot to help set up their machines because they could now build VMs like they built their users' Macs. So two tools that can be used to build VMs with Netboot are Deploy Studio and Apple System Image Utility. Netboot sets associated with these tools allow Mac admins to boot their VM from the relevant Netboot set and then apply whatever installs and configurations are desired. Now my preferred tool for building VMs is Deploy Studio. Deploy Studio offers great flexibility when building Macs, and that same versatility can be applied to VMs. So in my own shop, I'm using Create OS X Install PKG to generate OS X installers, which I then use with Deploy Studio to help me build VM templates. Now for those unfamiliar with it, Create OS X Install PKG is a tool created by Greg Nagel at Disney. It's used to build individual installer packages that can install OS X Lion, Mountain Lion, Mavericks, Yosemite, or you know, even future releases of OS X uh, in the same way that you may install Microsoft Office or other applications. Now the advantage of using this tool is that a number of system deployment tools for Macs can already deploy the installers created by this tool. And that allows OS X installations or upgrades to be performed by the systems management tool that's already in use by a particular IT shop. Now, one great thing about using this tool is that Create OS X Install PKG will create an installer package that will either install a stock copy of OS X, or you can add additional packages to that stock OS X install. There's a couple of guidelines to keep in mind here, though. The first is that there is about 350 megabytes of free space available in the OS X installer, and that can vary a bit between OS X versions. Now, that's sufficient space for configuration or a bootstrapping package, but it's not a good idea to add like Microsoft Office or another similar large installer. And the second is that the limitations of the OS install environment means that there are a number of installers that simply won't install correctly. Now, in particular, packages that use pre-installation or post-installation scripts may fail to run properly when those packages are run as part of the OS installation process. Now, to help work around this limitation, I developed a solution that I'll be discussing in more detail later in the talk. Deploy Studio can deploy an OS installer built by Create OS 10 Install PKG, but you'll need to make sure that you've added Python support. Now, to add this support, you'll need to create your Deploy Studio boot set with Python selected as a tool to include in the bootable system. Now, as shown on the screen, adding, check, uh, adding Python is a checkbox option in the Deploy Studio Assistant application that's used to create Deploy Studio boot sets. Now, to deploy the OS installer into a new VM, you'd set up a new workflow in Deploy Studio to install the package as a non-postponed install. Now, this is important because it'll set up a new VM's empty boot drive with the needed boot support to install OS X. So once the necessary workflow has been created in Deploy Studio, you can set up a new VM. And in VMware Fusion, my normal method is by creating a customized VM. In the Create a, custom, uh, create a Virtual Machine window, you can access this by selecting More Options and then selecting Create a Custom Virtual Machine. In the Choose Operating System window, just select your OS as appropriate. And in the Finish window, select Customize Settings. This will allow you to change the VM settings ahead of its first boot. In the network adapter settings, you'll want to select auto detect under bridge networking. This will allow the VM to uh, correctly boot from the netboot set. Now at this point, you may also want to adjust the VM's uh, available RAM 
and other settings, but that's really up to you. The VM is now ready for the next steps. Now in this example, VM is configured to use Yosemite as its OS, but it has a formatted and completely empty boot drive. So if the, Deploidio, if the Deploy Studio boot set is set as the default boot set on the NetBoot server, you can start the VM and then do nothing. The VM should boot to Deploy Studio automatically when it fails to find an OS on either the empty boot drive or the non-existent optical drive. Alternatively, you can also hold down the N key on your keyboard to boot the VM from the default NetBoot set. So let's take a little look at how that works. So I booted to Deploy Studio. I'm going to go ahead and log in. As you can see, I've got a number of workflows set up. So in this case, I'm going to select Install 1010 in a Virtual Machine. It's going to go through and uh, install that installer package as a non-postponed install onto that empty boot drive. And when it's finished, I'm going to hit Quit. Uh, as you can see from the time elapsed, I used a little movie magic to make that go faster. <laughs> so when we hit Quit, it's, the VM will reboot. And then we're going to go into the OS install environment. So at this point, we've run through a complete uh, install of Yosemite, if only they all went that fast. And uh, once again, a little movie magic. Uh, then it's going to automatically restart. And at this point, we're at Setup Assistant. The VM is set up with that default install. And at this point, you know, it's ready to go uh, for you to just go through the Setup Assistant like you would on a regular Mac and start your testing. Now, the example I just described will set up a VM with only Yosemite installed, but you can customize further. Now, in my own shop, I normally reboot back to Deploy Studio and run an additional workflow on the VM. So, back in Deploy Studio, I'm going to select the Setup 1010 VM workflow. And let's go ahead and run through the steps. It's going to ask me what I want to name the machine. In this case, I'm just going to stick with whatever Deploy Studio tossed me. And then at this point, it's going to run through a series of automated steps, like it's going to run software update for me. It's going to install some packages and scripts for me. It's going to install a local admin user for me. And it's also going to install applications that match my production environment, like Firefox, like Office, like Adobe Reader, um, both kinds of Java. My printer drivers, Sophos Antivirus, some scripts that uh, I have for making sure Java web plugins stay enabled. X11 because I've got a lot of MATLAB users. Xcode because I've got a lot of developers. A couple other scripts. Uh, settings for my login window. I don't like Gatekeeper, so I turn that off. And I'm renaming uh, the hard drive to match a convention we have in my shop. So once we're done, once again, a little more movie magic because that took 7 minutes, 27 seconds. So after the, uh, the VM reboots, um, for those not familiar with Deploy Studio, this is what's known as uh, the Deploy uh, Studio Finalize screen. And what this is, is an application that covers up the login screen to make sure people can't log in and mess with things, while it displays the log of what's going on. So the Play Studio Finalize is going to go through, install all those packages and scripts that I told it to, and then it's going to restart the machine. And here we are. As you can see, I'm not at the Setup Assistant. It's back at the login window. So I'm going to go ahead and log in with that local administrator account that I'd installed as part of the process. And as you can see by the customized doc and the fact that I've got an application sitting out on the desktop, I've made some changes to uh, my local administrator account to customize it for my needs. And at this point, I'm ready to go with my testing. But notice what I needed to do. I needed to boot to Deploy Studio. I needed to select a workflow. And then I needed to go get coffee. <laughs> so as mentioned previously, the limitations of the OS install environment mean that some packages won't install correctly. Now in particular, Packages that use pre-install or post-install scripts as part of their normal installation process may fail to run properly in the OS installer environment. Now, to help work around this limitation, I've developed First Boot Package Install Generator.app. And this is an application that generates installer packages that enable other packages to be installed during the, first, uh, the initial boot of either a Mac or a VM. Now, this solves the issue because the installers are no longer running in the OS X installer environment. Instead, they're running at first boot, and they can run any associated pre-install or post-install scripts. 
The first big package install generator installer, along with the app's components and scripts, are available from GitHub using the link on the screen. Now, one potential use of a first boot package would be to allow you to add a systems management agent like Casper, Puppet, Absolute Manage, or others to the OS installer. Once the agent reported in, the systems management tool could have its agent install additional software and scripts to configure that VM. Now, one management tool that would not require a first boot package would be Monkey, which was also developed by Greg Nagel. Monkey's tools can be added directly to a Create OS X installed PKG built OS X installer. If you don't want to use Create OS X install PKG, though, you don't have to. You should be able to install a disk image into a VM, just like you can on a Mac. Now, for building disk images, I recommend using Per Olofsson's Auto Damage tool. I'd also like to note that Auto Damage is how Per himself has indicated he wants it to be pronounced. I myself have nothing but warmth and affection for this tool. So, as described previously, my preferred way to create VMs is by leveraging Netboot and Deploy Studio but not all environments are gonna have access to Netboot or Deploy Studio. And for those environments, there's scripted ways to create Lion, Mountain Lion, Mavericks, or Yosemite installer disk images for use with VMware Fusion. Now this allows the creation of OS X VMs that can configure themselves in an automated fashion without needing access to either Netboot or server resources. And this may also work on a certain, not yet released, future OS release from Apple as well. Uh, Tim Sutton from Concordia University in Montreal, Canada, was the first person who I know of to apply this to OS X VMs as part of his work with Vagrant and Packer. So if you haven't previously heard of it, uh, Vagrant is a tool for building virtual machines in a consistent, repeatable way using automated workflows. Now it's popular with development teams because it allows everyone working on a project to spin up identical virtual machines that contains their shared development environment. Now in turn, Packer is a complementary open source tool that is used to build OS images for Vagrant to use when building new VMs. Now, part of, as part of his work with Packer and Viwi, another open source tool for building OS images for Vagrant, uh, Tim developed a script that would convert an OS X installer into an ISO disk image that either Viwi or Packer could use. I was able to build on Tim's work to develop a script that creates a customized OS X installer that can be used in VMware Fusion without the need for either Vagrant or Packer. My method uses a first boot package to provide the customization for the OS X install. Now, as long as everything is configured according to the directions, users of the script will be able to produce a VMware-ready installer disk image that will install OS X and a first boot package into a new VM. So, when the VM boots, OS X and the first boot package will automatically install into the uh, VM's boot drive. And once the installation completes, the VM then reboots. And on reboot, a log will be displayed while the packages included with the first boot package are installed into the VM. Now once the package is finished installing, the VM will automatically reboot again. And after that second reboot, the VM should be set up with the desired applications and settings. Now I'd previously mentioned this in connection with Create OS X install PKG, but you can also use your existing systems management tool with a custom OS X install disk image to help you build and configure your virtual machines. Now, in this scenario, you would build a simple installation process for your VMs that installs just the OS and your system management tools agent. Once the agent on the VM phones home to the management service, the systems management tool can have its agent download and install additional scripts and software to configure that VM. Now, properly configured, this approach would allow VMs to be built with either no or very little effort on your part. So, once I've got these virtual machines built in VMware Fusion, I prefer to use those as templates or parent VMs. That way I can use what I built as a source for other VMs to follow. So VMware Fusion 6 Professional added some functionality to facilitate this way of working by bringing the ability to clone VMs from VMware Workstation on Windows and adding it to VMware Fusion on the Mac. Now there's two ways that you can clone a VM in VMware Fusion 6 Professional or later. The first is by making a full clone and the other way is by making a linked clone. So, What's the difference between these two ways of cloning? Well, a full clone is an independent copy of a virtual machine. Ongoing operation of a full clone is entirely separate from the parent virtual machine, and either the clone or the parent VM can be deleted without affecting the other. A linked clone is made from a snapshot of the parent VM. Now, a snapshot preserves the state and data at a virtual, of a virtual machine at a particular point in time. That state includes what's uh, stored in memory, running applications, anything else the VM was doing at that particular time. Now, using a snapshot saves space because the link clone can reference all files that were available on that parent VM, but it doesn't actually need to store a complete copy of those files. 
because a link clone is a snapshot of, of another VM and it's not a complete copy, a link clone must have continued access to the parent VM that the snapshot was made from. Without access to that parent VM, the, v, uh, the link clone stops working. Now, that said, changes to the parent VM do not affect the link clone, and changes to the disk of the link clone do not affect the parent. So when I'm using clones in Fusion, I have a couple of rules of thumb. I do a lot of testing where I'm using a particular clone once or twice for a particular purpose, and then I'm tossing it. Now in this case where the test VM will only be around for a short amount of time, using a link clone makes a lot of sense because it saves space and I don't have to worry about keeping it around for the long term. Now if I'm planning for a particular clone to stay around for a while, I make a full clone. Now this way I don't have to worry about keeping track of the clone's parent VM because the full clone is a fully self-contained copy of that parent VM. Once you have a VM built, you may want to edit it to emulate a specific Mac model. Now one reason for doing this would be to test model-specific updates from Apple Software Update. The first step is to locate the model identifier of the Mac you want to emulate. Now one way to do this is by checking System Profiler on an appropriate Mac. In the case of the machine on the screen, we're going to be using the model identifier for a 2013 Retina MacBook Pro. Now to set your VM to report itself as a specific Mac model, you'll need to add the hardware model settings to your VM's configuration settings. Now to do this, select the VM you want and make sure it's not running. This is very important, the VM must be completely shut down at the time. Next, you'd hold down the option key on your keyboard and right click on the virtual machine. Select open config file and editor and that will make the VM's configuration available for editing. Now in the configuration editor, you would add a line like that shown on the screen, substituting the actual model where I've got model here. Now once your edits are finished, save your changes. And the next time you launch the VM, it should identify itself as being the specified Mac model. Now in the case of our example, the VM is identifying itself as being a MacBook Pro. One issue you may run across in VMware Fusion VMs is that some services won't seem to work properly even though they look like they should. Now in this case, I recommend checking what the hardware serial number is set to be. In older guest OSs like 10.7 or 10.8, this may be longer than the 12 characters that Apple is expecting a Mac serial number to be. So in these cases, VMware has added a way to generate a serial number that is 12 characters long. So you can address this issue by adding settings to your VM's configuration file. Now to apply this, you would shut down the VM and open the configuration editor. In the configuration editor, you would then add a line like that shown on the screen. Once your edits are finished, save your changes and restart the VM. Now when the VM starts up, the serial number should now be no longer than 12 characters long. And this may solve some problems with profiles not applying or other just little odd issues. Now this option is enabled by default in VMware Fusion for Macs running, uh, VMs running Mavericks or later, but you may need to set it for VMs running Lion or Mountain Lion. Okay. At this point, I'm gonna start talking about OS 10 VMs and VMware's ESXi server. Before I do though, I wanna say some things that it's hopefully gonna save some questions later. So, many times when I mention Apple, VMware, and ESXi in proximity to each other, I have a conversation that goes like this. Someone asks if VMware now supports running OS 10 on non-Apple hardware. I tell them no. OS 10 VMs are supported only on Apple hardware. Person usually responds that it would be nice if they could run OS 10 on their ESXi or VCR setup like they can their other operating systems. I fully agree with that opinion. It would be nice. Running OS 10 on non-Apple hardware is not a technical problem. It is a license issue. And the people who can address this issue work at the location shown on the screen. <laughs> so now that it's understood that I'm talking, I'm only talking about ESXi running on Apple hardware. Let's talk, about, let's talk about hosting OS 10 VMs on ESXi. So in particular, VMware brought some support over to ESXi 5, 5, and 6, which completely changed how I built VMs on ESXi. So what changed things is that VMware added Netboot support for ESXi hosted OS 10 VMs. In fact, you can stand up a Netboot support, a server, Netboot server in one ESXi OS 10 VM and use it to boot other ESXi hosted OS 10 VMs. So needless to say, this greatly simplified my build process because I can now leverage the same Netboot deployment process that I'm using with VMware Fusion. 
Support for NetBoot and ESXi has all but eliminated any need for me to build OS 10 VMs in Fusion first, and then transfer them to an ESXi server. So there is one difference between building OS 10 VMs in Fusion and building them in ESXi, and that is that Fusion will format the VM's boot drive as part of the creation of the VM. ESXi hosted OS 10 VMs will need to have their drives formatted. Unfortunately, Deploy Studio's disk partitioning tools may not be able to correctly detect the unformatted drive on an ESXi hosted OS 10 VM like they can on a Mac. So it can be difficult to include an automated format of the drive as part of the VM build process. Now, fortunately, this issue can be solved while still booted into Deploy Studio. One of the tools available in the Deploy Studio boot set is Apple's Disk Utility, which can be used to format the drive before running a Deploy Studio workflow on it. Even with the ability to host a NetBoot server on ESXi, there's just going to be environments where you just can't use NetBoot. You can solve this issue also looking at a tool that we previously looked at with VMware Fusion. So one of the functions built into the custom OS 10 installer build script that we discussed earlier is the option of creating an ISO disk image for use with ESXi. So selecting the option of the script to create an ISO for ESXi will create two disk images, one for VMware Fusion and the other one being an ISO for ESXi. Now you can use the ISO as an installer disk for an ESXi VM, much like you could use the OS X uh, disk image as an installer disk for VMware Fusion VMs. So let's take a look at what the process of building an ESXi hosted uh, VM with a custom OS X installer looks like. And in this instance, we're going to be building it using Yosemite. So first thing we're going to do, I'm going to log into my ESXi server. I have a self-signed certificate, so I have to tell it, ignore that warning. Use proper SSL certs. Um, so, don't have any VMs set up, so let's go ahead and fix that. So I'm going into Virtual Machine Wizard. I'm going to select Custom because there's a couple settings I need to set this way. So I'm going to build a VM named Yosemite VM. I'm going to select my ESXi data store. I'm going to select Hardware Version 11 because by doing that, I can build a 1010 uh, VM. So I'm good to go there. Uh, OS 10 VMs really do want at least a couple of processors, so I'm setting that for a couple of cores. Likewise, they're not really happy with two gigs of RAM, so I'm going to change that to four gigs of RAM. Uh, network, going to stick with the default. Going to stick with the default there. Select the disk. I want to create a new virtual disk. Eh, 40 gigs is fine for a test VM. SCSI? Sure, SCSI. And uh, I'm going to need to edit the virtual machine settings before completion, so I'm going to go ahead and check that box and then hit continue. And what I need to edit is I need to set up the VM to boot from that ISO file. So I previously uploaded an ISO, which I'm going to go find on uh, my one data store. There we go. Let me select that. Hit OK. And very, very important, come up here to the top and click Connect to Power On. It's very important to click that because otherwise your VM doesn't see an optical drive and you hit the pop, you hit the play button and nothing happens. So please avoid the mistake I've made time and again. Make sure to check that box. So now we're all set to go. Let's pop it into the uh, console view full screen and let's see how this goes. So hitting play to start up that uh, VM. It's found the ISO and it's booting from it. And one thing I've actually built into the custom OS 10 installed uh, disk image process is that possibility of doing that automated format. So if you're doing it this way, it's going to automatically find and erase the hard drive and then install your OS onto it. Once again, if only all Yosemite installs went this fast. So here we are at that first boot. That first boot package process is kicking in, so you would see a log like this. It goes through, installs my various packages and scripts, and once it's finished, it's going to automatically reboot. <coughs> and there we go. One VM configured, ready to go for testing. So one issue you may run across in ESXi VMs like you do in Fusion is that the hardware serial number may be set to be longer than the 12 characters that Apple's expecting the serial number to be. Now you can fix this by using roughly the same method that you would in VMware Fusion. 
To apply this, shut down the VM and then open the uh, configuration editor. In the configuration editor, you'd add a line like that shown on the screen. Now, once your edits are finished, you save your uh, changes and then restart the VM. And once you have your VM stood up on your ESXi server, a new feature in VMware Fusion 7 Professional is that you can connect your, to your ESXi server from Fusion. Now, depending on your management needs, you may be able to use Fusion instead of the Windows vSphere client that I was using in the previous examples. <coughs> So as you can see, you know, it's not as well featured as the uh, vSphere client was, but it does give you a lot of basic information. Um, tells you how much memory is being used. It also tells you CPU, there's a drop down menu. Tells you how much space is on your data stores. You know, depending on what you need, this is pretty good. And another capability is being able to upload VMs from Fusion to an ESXi server. So I've got my Fusion hosted VM. Want to upload it to my ESXi server. Going to select my data store and hit upload. Once again, not real world speed, your mileage may vary. But as you can see, I've now got that uh, VM seemingly listed twice because I've got it in Fusion, but now I've also got it hosted up on my ESXi server. Now there is an issue to be aware of presently when uploading or downloading VMs between VMware Fusion and ESXi 6, and that is that the necessary SMC present equals true attribute for an OS 10 VM is not being transferred as part of the uh, BMX configuration file. Now, why this is important is that the SMC present equals true attribute allows a VM with OS X as the guest OS to check and detect that it's running on Apple hardware. Without this check succeeding, the VM can't verify that it's running on Apple hardware, and it will not complete startup successfully, and it will appear to hang on boot. Now, Fusion can also be used to start a remote console session for ESXi hosted VMs. So in this case, you know, this may be a substitute for using screen sharing or something else, where you can just pop open that uh, remote console session and start working directly with your VM. And the nice thing about this is that this works even if the VM is shut down. So say you wanted to netboot that VM from a shutdown uh, position, all you have to do is just click on the play button like you normally do, hold down the N key, and that ESXi hosted VM should boot from the default netboot set. So this is a very, very useful thing for me. We've done all this work. You stood up your virtual machines. What can you test? This session is about testing. Well, it may be more accurate to say, what can't you test? So one area where I use VMs a lot is with File Vault 2 testing. This has been handy to me in particular because I can snapshot a VM and capture it in an unencrypted state before proceeding to encrypt the VM. Now, if the testing doesn't go like I expected, I can roll back to the snapshot and I'll have an instantly decrypted VM that's ready for the next round of testing. And I have to say, this is my favorite thing that I found I could test in the VM. So give it a few seconds. So if anyone asks if you can test the system lock in a VM, you can. Uh, wipe does not work. And I'll explain that in a little more uh, in a couple minutes. But, uh, <laughs> but as far as like system lock goes, works fine. So if you ever need to demo that for anybody. So VMs do have some limitations because they are software constructs and not actual hardware. Here's what I found can't be tested in a virtualized environment. Anything involving having an Apple registered hardware serial number or sending that hardware serial number back to Apple. And this includes iCloud services like Find My Mac and Messages. And it also applies to getting hardware specific OS installers via Recovery HD. Now, it may seem that things are working properly uh, on your end, when you enable like Find My Mac because you wanted to make some screenshots and everything else, and it looks like it's working okay, it may not be reporting back to Apple properly. For example, like I, how I just mentioned that remote wipe doesn't work, that's because when I enrolled in Find My Mac, I went and took a look at how my VM was being reported via the Find My iPhone site on the iCloud site. And it reported itself as an iPhone, which this is a VM, it's not an iPhone. But that explains why the remote wipe didn't work. Because it was expecting you know, to talk to an iPhone for that remote wipe, and the underlying architecture is different. Though apparently, the MDM command for system lock is similar enough between OS X and iOS that the system lock does work. Most things involving EFI, so functions like Apple Internet Recovery or holding down the option key to get a list of bootable volumes, will not work. 
However, some things involving EFI work specifically because uh, VMware made them work. For example, both NetBoot and Fireball 2 involve EFI, and they work fine in a VMware VM. Wireless connections. Your VM does not have a Wi-Fi card, though it may talk to your network via your max Wi-Fi connection. Normally, from your VM's perspective, it's an all Ethernet world all the time. So you can test in a VM to make sure that your Wi-Fi settings apply. You can't really test to make sure they actually work. So for that, that is a situation where you'll still need that test, you know, test laptop, test desktop, whatever, to check your wireless settings and make sure they work. So as Mac admins, we're always up against the clock for testing. So in my own environment, I've become reliant on virtual machines to speed up my development and testing cycle while reducing the physical footprint of my test environment. So instead of needing multiple machines to test uh, changes to my deployment workflow, I, my testing now takes place almost exclusively on a quad-core Retina MacBook Pro with 16 gigs of RAM. And likewise, having NetBoot and Deploy Studio available to build test VMs means that I can be testing multiple workflows simultaneously on the same laptop. If a particular build hits a problem, I can discard that VM, fix the problem, and then quickly create a new VM with the updated build. So just as an example, that's Yosemite, that's Mavericks, that's Mountain Lion. I don't remember exactly what I was testing, uh, but I was testing on all three at the same time, and I could test all three at the same time. So in addition to testing your Macs, another use for VMs is building ones for specific purposes. And this may be to support your test environment, may also be to support your production environment. Now, in this case, I would recommend building a VM to support just you know, one uh, particular task, though of course you can have it do more than one. For example, I write a lot of documentation. And it's been useful to me to have VMs readily available with certain characteristics. So to support this, I have workflows that build VMs with specific host names, user accounts with generic names, and custom directories. And this gives me the standard environment that I prefer when writing documentation, where everything's set up with generic host uh, names and locations that I prefer to use. Now, among other things, this greatly speeds up my ability to take screenshots and screen capture movies or use with my documentation. Now, another way I've been leveraging custom purpose VMs is by using them to host and run tools like AutoPackage and AutoPackager. Now, these are open source tools I use to download new software updates from vendors and upload them to my systems management tool. I can build a VM on an ESXi server and have the VM dedicated to running this particular job full time, rather than tying up a physical Mac with this same job. Now, in the event of a problem, being able to snapshot or clone the VM allows me to back it up quickly before I start troubleshooting it. So to sum up, virtual machines plus automated build processes equals more time for you. Now, virtual machines running OS X can be resource hogs, as you'll need to assign at least two processors, as well as three to four gigabytes of RAM to have them run at usable speeds. Now, that said, the time and resources savings realized by using virtual machines instead of actual hardware should help make the case for investing in one or two speedy Macs running virtual machines instead of a multitude of actual test machines. So, got some links from my blog covering various things. Uh, some more links. This is from uh, Virtually Ghetto, uh, which is written by uh, William Lamb. He is a VMware engineer who's been very generous and very uh, sharing about getting ESXi running on Apple hardware, in particular unsupported hardware like the Mac Mini. He also talks about the Mac Pro. He just shares so much uh, information, it's fantastic. Got some more links. And even more links, including links to uh, my first boot package install generator application and also create OS 10 install PKG. And possibly the most important links you'll see in this entire presentation, this is where you get it all. So PDF is available for the, the uh, top link and the keynote slides, which includes absolutely everything, the movies, my presenter's notes, absolutely everything, that is available from the link down at the bottom. And I'm gonna leave that on the screen and open the floor to questions. Hi, Rich. Hello. Um, I don't know if maybe uh, it was included in some of the packages that you include when you set up a VM, uh, but you have a blog post about the beam handling issue in Yosemite. Yes. And is that still an issue? That That, that is still an issue. VMware has said that they're going to fix it in a, quote, future release of VMware tools. 
As of today, they have not yet released that future version of VMware tools that fixes that issue. So uh, the beam sync issue is still an issue in Yosemite. And for those who don't know what I'm talking about, what, what would we experience if we set up a Yosemite VM? Okay, so if you set up a Yosemite VM, especially one that does not have at least the current version of VMware tools installed, you will experience a slow and uh, uh, kind of a slow VM where redraw is slow and you'll have weird things being transparent where they shouldn't be transparent. And the issue at heart is uh, beam synchronization, which is, uh, you know what? I'm actually going to have to go back to my notes for the technical details on this. But what it is is that it is looking for some kind of hardware graphic acceleration uh, to make this work. And um, VMs don't have an actual video card. They have the graphic acceleration that VMware can provide, which for folks experienced with VMs, it's not awesome. So uh, by disabling beam sync, you get that problem out of the way, and it speeds up your Yosemite VM immensely. So I do have a, if you search for beam sync, uh, at dareflounder.wordpress.com. Uh, it should come up with the details. Yes? Would it be uh, possible to test something like Pro Tools in a VM, something that requires an iLock? OK, so you need something that has a hardware dongle? Possibly, because VMware allows for uh, essentially USB pass-through. So you can plug an actual USB dongle into the side of your machine and configure it so that uh, the VM is the one that's accessing it instead of your Mac. Um, you know, most often for me, this manifests when I plug in a flash drive and VMware Fusion pops up and says, do you want this to connect to your VM or to your Mac? And I say, of course, I want this to connect to my Mac. Stop asking me this question. Uh, but it, that may be something that you can use uh, for your testing. On one of your slides, you mentioned that you use snapshots, or I'm sorry, that you use uh, linked clones yes. for kind of a test and throw away. Mm -hmm. I'm curious what workflows you use snapshots for and which ones you use the linked clones for, or are they kind of interchangeable? Uh, uh, to be honest, I actually don't do a lot of snapshotting because for me, they can bulk up the size of the VM because, of course, it has to be storing that additional information. I'll use snap, so linked clones would be like, I want to test one specific thing. So I will uh, make a linked clone from the parent VM, install that one thing, run that one test, see what the results are. If I then want to make sure that I have the before and after, that's when I make a snapshot. So basically, in that case, the workflow would be create linked clone, make snapshot, do the thing, check the results. If I didn't like it, roll the snapshot back. If I did like it, eh, I'm done. And at that point, I can toss the linked clone snapshot all. Hi, Rich. Um, I've had some success using uh, Casper and Netboot to uh, create the full VM, but mm -hmm. um, and for the most part, uh, the JSS recognizes it, and it, it's kind of its own virtual machine uh, in the JSS. But uh, is it possible to create a linked VM that would identify separately um, in the JSS, or can you comment at all on how that behavior might impact policies that I'm trying to test like in, with those mm -hmm. linked VMs? I mean, for that kind of thing, uh, so what you want to do is have linked clones appear as separate machines. Uh, one way you could accomplish that is uh, by giving that uh, new linked clone a separate host name, because that should register itself separately. I mean, if they're all registering using the same host name, it's going to get confusing. Mm -hmm. But if you give it a separate host name, the JSS should usually go, oh, OK, this is different enough that I'll pop up that second one. And I've also done, you know, when, it, when a machine's been enrolled, I'll like, you know, get it enrolled, then make that the template, and just keep linked clone and snapshotting it, and the JSS just happily is like, hey, yeah, I can keep using that. You've been enrolled. So yeah, I mean, I've definitely done that kind of testing before. Cool, thank you. No problem. Is there still the limitation with, uh, with Fusion and ESXi that net booting has to be done from a, from a cold boot? Yes, that limitation does still exist. Uh, what that's referring to is if you just restart a VM, like you go to the Apple menu or whatever, and you just tell it to restart, and then you hold down the N key, it will go back into OS X. It won't net boot. 
So what has to happen in order to make sure that you're netbooting is shut down the VM, let it rest for at least a couple seconds, start it up, and then immediately hold down the end key. And at that point, it should netboot. Anybody else? More questions? All right. I, I, apparently, I've explained things very thoroughly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, last call for questions. Oh, yes, we got one question. Um, the, uh, oh, sorry, sir. Could you come up to the mic so the the folks watching at home need to be also able to hear the questions? Uh, this isn't so much a question as um, the links above are getting an error because uh, generating too much traffic. Ah. <laughs> So that, that teaches me to use free Dropbox. Um, OK, so I guess I've hit the bandwidth limit for uh, the day, because especially the keynote slides are not small. Uh, what I, I recommend is uh, you know, get it, you know, take a picture with your phone. Um, I'll also be posting these links up on my blog. Maybe try to get them a little later. Well, Ivy. Yes, um, I have a question. And oh, I'm sorry. Would you mind the microphone? Uh, you may have oh, to go okay. to the mountain. So I have a question, and seeing that we have 34 minutes uh, left, I guess I'm oh, yeah, playing a little of bit of devil's advocate, um, just so to try and get more conversation flowing. Um, so say for someone, well, so I, I feel that some of these steps that you've provided to us maybe started on step five or step six or step seven. Uh, for those of us who are really, truly brand new, uh, maybe only have a VMware Fusion set up and are working with ESXi for the first time, mm -hmm. and have resources like the Mac OS X installer, where would we start? Uh, you know what, honestly, uh, were you able to attend Joe Chilcote's uh, presentation this morning? I was not, so okay. that's... That, that's a good, where I would start actually is before hitting ESXi, I would start with Fusion. Um, I would also recommend watching uh, Joe's presentation. Uh, because one thing you can do with Fusion is you can kind of, uh, you can run multiple VMs in Fusion, and there is an option if you're starting them from the command line. There, there's a command line option to start VMs. And you can add in what's known as the no GUI option, and that tells them to run headless. So from your perspective, uh, you don't even need to have Fusion running in order for your VMs to be running. So if you just want to have multiple VMs up and running, you can start that. You know, you can start that process just by using VMware Fusion uh, and getting comfortable with that. So that would be one way to go. Um, I mean, ESXi is one of those things that it's a it's a complex topic. Uh, however, to at least get started with it, I do have uh, some blog posts on ESXi, at least on how to install, how to get you know started to the point where ESXi is up and working. And at that point, VMware does have some excellent documentation for things like getting a VM stood up for the first time, what you should do. I mean, there, there's a whole lot of things involved with storage tuning and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But for very basic things, you know, ESXi is remarkably easy to work with, and VMware does have some good documentation. And I'd be happy to talk more about that after the session. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, Rich, with regards to the um, the unique uh, model identifier, creating custom VMs so that you're simulating a, a MacBook Pro 11, mm -hmm. 3, 12, 1, whatever it might be. Right. Um, when wanting to test all the multiple models before before a deployment of some kind, uh, kind of similar to what you were doing with your multiple OSs. Mm -hmm. So you want to test all you're running is Mavericks, and you want to test four VMs at a time for the four different models that that's going to go to. Okay. Do you, what's your, what's your preferred way do you, as far as like, do you just link up uh, several clones to do that? Or do you prefer doing a full clone uh, and your kind of your reasoning behind that? Hmm. For this, I would really recommend doing a full clone for this okay. because you're going to be making changes to uh, the VMX configuration file. You can't, you may be also able to do this to a link clone. I haven't tried that. Okay. Um, for the most part, when I'm doing the model, uh, I try to keep things as generic as possible uh, in terms of my deployment workflow, so I'm not necessarily testing something specific. When I, do, when I have done that, it's usually to test, I need this specific update coming down from software update. Okay. And in those cases, I've been using full clones of my uh, 
template uh, my you know my parent VMs. Okay. So, uh, like I said, I can't think of a reason why this shouldn't work with the linked clone. I simply haven't tried it. Okay. Yeah, my thought was just if you're if you are limited in space and you have six different unique models you needed to test. If the I was oh, just curious yeah. if even the linked would work properly or if you'd just run into problems with it. Yeah, I I can't think of a reason why it wouldn't work. Okay. And I'll, I'll just I'm going to stand on that answer. It's a race. Hey. <laughs> Have you ever tried using the model identifier switch to capture a forked OS? I have tried. I have failed. Uh, the reason for that is that in order to do that, you need to be able to boot to Apple Internet Recovery, and that's one thing that doesn't appear to work right. Very good. What if you just use Recovery? I tried that, and what it does is it gives me the MAS version. It, it'll, it'll pop up and it'll say, hey, give me your Apple ID, and then I do that, and then it gives me the MAS version. So it doesn't work, unfortunately. Hello, Rich. Um, I'm going to play the devil's advocate card again. Um, so this mainly covers use with uh, VMware. Okay. And um, there are other tools that host VMs. Um, I'm like some people maybe in a situation where they're like, well, when I started, we have a license for something else mm -hmm. and we don't want to spend X to get VMware. Um, do you have any like tips or can point in any direction for other providers or? Okay, so uh, in a, I don't know answer works as well. <laughs> uh, no, I do. Uh, uh, so different virtualization solutions are going to have varying levels of support for OS 10. Parallels 10, I think, is the latest version, or are they up to 11 now? Yeah, I think it's 10. 10. Okay, they added netboot support in that version of Parallels. Um, I know. Uh, I want to say Bryson uh, at Jamf. He has a uh, yep, lovely blog post. So I was handed in the back on how he got like uh, Fireball two testing, and I believe also Netboot working with Parallels. Um, so as far as you know, getting that kind of testing setup working, um, I believe Parallels ten specifically, uh, the latest version should do. You know, I I don't use it, so I can't speak definitively, um, but it should get you most of the way that you that I've been able to with VMware Fusion. Uh, I would have, hmm, trying to think of what to say about VirtualBox. Uh, <laughs> VirtualBox's support for OS X is not the best, and uh, there has been some unusual quirks when using, uh, especially some of the solutions that I've written. My favorite was uh, someone filed a bug report on my script for creating custom OS X install disk images, where he said, I need you to fix the software update problem. And I said, what software update problem? He said, it keeps asking me for this Thunderbolt EFI update, and it won't stop. I was like, do you have it hooked up to a Thunderbolt monitor? I, do you have actual Thunderbolt hardware hooked up to it? He's like, no, I don't have any. I was like, so you're just in a VM in VirtualBox, and it's asking you for the Thunderbolt EFI update. He's like, yeah, you need to fix that. I'm going, I actually don't, because that, that VM thinks it has Thunderbolt peripherals, and it doesn't. So something else is going on, and uh, at that point we got into a discussion about um, how I don't support things really other than the things I say I support, and how I should, and, <laughs> and eventually the issue got closed, and then he commented again, and I just didn't respond. Um, so um, yeah, VirtualBox is, uh, it's kind of, it's definitely a, a your mileage may vary solution. I love it for Linux, it's great for Linux, for OS 10, it's just a bumpy road. Thank you. So, I've actually been using um, uh, VMware Fusion for a lot of the stuff that you just talked about, um, and uh, primarily I use it for packaging. You know, looking at packages, building packages, downloading packages. Um, now, with with some of the apps from the Mac App Store. Um, some of them look at the, you know, hardware and will determine whether your computer can handle certain apps. Um, Interesting. Yeah, so like iMovie, for example. Oh, um, yeah, that one looks for a graphics card, yeah. Right, and oh. so I, I was curious if you've been able to get around that in any fashion. Um, hardware limitations, no. Uh, it's one of those things where VMware says what hardware the VM has, and I don't really have good solutions for expanding beyond that. If it's software, yeah, it's one of those things. You can figure it out if it's software. 
but uh, for hardware limitations, we're, you know, whatever VMware provides is whatever VMware provides. And that's going to apply to any virtualization solution, unfortunately. Oh, I meant to ask, how far did the candy get? <laughs> All right, is, is it empty or has it still got stuff in it? Keep passing it around. We never got it. Yeah, I think from this row forward on that side. So just, just to repeat what I said before about the candy, you know, take some candy if you want some. If you don't want candy, just pass it on to your neighbor. And uh, um, if you think it's a bad idea for me to pass around candy, please let me know after the session. <laughs> Anybody else have questions? Any questions at all? Feedback? Uh, general conversation? All right, you know what? I love early dismissal. Y'all have been a lovely audience. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>